comet, three high atlases, either missing something really big or it's hiding it, which may have a very plausible explanation. <laughs> well, to see what I'm talking about, hang on to your seats, guys. This is Galactic Graves. I'm going to share y'all a picture to kind of give you a little background because when I talked about this image right here originally a few days ago, I was telling you, hmm, I think something's missing. But I said, I'm not going to detail yet because this photograph is way too grainy to ascertain. I did not want to lay judgment, so I kept my mouth shut. This is days before anybody else started yapping about it. Well, a lot of people are, are talking about it now. And what are we talking about? The tail. Well, we've got better photographs now. And, of course, this was one of the first photograph released from the uh, Lowell Observatory near Flagstaff, Arizona, the Happy Jack Telescope. Uh, just Happy Jack, Arizona. The Happy Jack, Arizona is not exactly coincident with uh, Flagstaff, but anyway, they're close. By uh, Kishin Zhang, Dr. Kishin Zhang. Uh, and he's actually been releasing a lot of data on this comet lately. And I'm kind of, I'm finding his uh, post, his claims about it quite interesting. Pardon me, I've had a cold. I've been very sick, uh, flu actually. So uh, if I sound like a gravel truck, that's why. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> so pardon me. This, uh, uh, to, to put it in context, let me stop the share and just talk about this a second. Then we'll go to the next pictures. To put it in context, uh, we know that the probably the lower limit for mass of Comet 3i Atlas for it not to be perturbed by the uh, 180 kg per second plume of dust it was putting out previously. For it not to be perturbed at all, the lower limit would be about 33 billion tons. That's a lot of mass. Now for it but to, it's not the most massive comet. But that's massive, most massive interstellar object. It's the fastest interstellar object that we've seen. But we've only had three examples so far. Borisov looked just like a comet, like we'd expect. A Mau Mau was really weird. And this thing is maybe weirder, but it doesn't mean it's not an object. Or is it? <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of claims and counterclaims. But the bottom line is, <coughs> for it to help, got the 0 0.02 centimeters per second per second acceleration at that mass, it would have had to sublimated into space uh, approximately 13%, maybe up to 20% of its mass, 10 to 20%, with 13% being kind of the, the, the most believed number, of its mass just to get that kind of reaction to get it accelerated like that. Non-gravitational acceleration we're talking about here. Now, comets do undergo non-gravitational acceleration through the thrust jets on the side. It's not really thrust like a rocket motor. It's just the the the, the material in it spewing out from being overheated, kind of like a boiling pot or a sublimation and stuff just evaporating off of it. So that's a very different thing than efficient Rocket. So it takes a lot more mass to have the same effect. The specific impulse, pound thrust per pound second, is exceedingly low. Exceedingly low. <coughs> so that said, uh, what should you expect in terms of mass use? You know, if you're going to lose 33 uh, out of a 33 billion tons at 13%, uh, you would lose 4.29 billion tons of mass into the coma and tail. It would go into the coma, then the sun would stream it into a tail. Coma is a gas cloud around the nucleus, and the sun would then stream that away into a tail. So that's how that tail is formed. And you already get two tails. But anyway, so electric and, you know, one from the solar wind. So there is a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the upper limit, if it was 26 uh, excuse me, if it was 20% uh, mass loss, would be 6.6 .6 billion tons. Now, I say upper limit. That's based on it weighing 33 billion tons. It could be more. If it's heavier, you could get even more of a coma, more of a tail, more matter ejected. Because the heavier it is, the more it's going to have to eject to get that kind of delta V, delta velocity, 
the, the acceleration change that it got. So <clears throat> by comparison, let's compare it to a couple things that we know about. Haley's Comet, which uh, made a really bright tail in 2010 when it passed by Earth. Actually, Earth went through the tail. It's claimed that people were reading in you know, newspapers at night by the light of the tail. I don't know if that's true or not. That would be pretty magnificent. I was really looking forward to seeing Haley's Comet when it came back in 1986, and it was a dud. It was a spectacular for generation after generation you know it was lit the skies up when the from the uh, when they had the invasion norman invasion of uh, england in 1066 but uh and for 100 many many come arounds it lit up i guess it just burned out by and 201910 was the last good show but in 1910 haley's comet uh sent out about 280 million tons metric tons uh, material for, into its common tail. 280 million metric tons. Nobody else is telling you this. You, this is why you come here. I, I go the rocket size. 280 million metric tons. So by comparison, by comparison, you know, that's about, you know, the uh, hell, 3i Atlas is sending out almost seven times more than that at the bottom threshold of 4.29 billion tons. A lot of people are using the term five billion tons. So metric tons, that's a lot of mass, but Hellbop, Hellbop put out about 30 billion metric tons. Now Hellbop, if you remember comment, Hellbop was hanging in the sky. Uh, the closest approach was in like 22nd of March, not in March of 2020, 20, and on 11 April 1997, I was out building my Halo SO1 rocket, putting it, the final the launch assembly together off uh, Topsail Beach in North Carolina. We got in the Guinness Book of World Records for that uh, rocket launch, highest amateur launch of a rocket at that time in the Millennium Book. So, Millennium Guinness Book, Millennium Edition. So, the uh, it was hanging in the sky. If I remember, it had hung in the sky for weeks. It was really bright. And I think you could see it even, you know, uh, in twilight and dawn. It was so visible. Now, Hellbop was about, uh, <coughs> ah, excuse me, 1.3 astronomical units from Earth. And uh, <coughs> 3i Atlas will be, 1.8 astronomical units from Earth. We won't be able to see hell, uh, three eye atlas with a naked eye unless something spectacular happens. We're not expected to see it at all. But you should be able to see it with a telescope, or maybe even binoculars. It might be a little brighter than they thought it would be, but you still won't see it with a naked eye. An eight inch telescope reflector would be a good bet. It should be in, by the 19th of August. It should be have migrated through the constellation Virgo into Leo. So, uh, but just by comparison, Hellbop did put out 30 billion tons, almost what we believe is the mass of uh, Three I Atlas. So I'm just giving you some comparisons here. But reason I say this is there should be right now a really big tail that could be seen by a telescope. There should be a big tail. That's why I go into this. That's the tail of this tail. <laughs> so let's see why uh, Dr. Zhang says it's there and we can't see it. That's what he says. Avi Loeb says it's not there. Uh, the, some people have pointed out there's like seven jets of anti-tail again, which is kind of odd. But um, so we're going to go into this. Let's look at this, guys. Here we are. So this is the later pictures taken, again, the Lowell Observatory in Happy Jack, Arizona. <clears throat> and Dr. Zhang says that the tail is behind the comet. It's there. He says you can see a little bit. He says it's brighter here on the left. We can see a little bit of a dimness here, but I also see a little bit of a dimness here. So I don't know, maybe down here, but also it's brighter there, brighter down here. 
So maybe it's kind of split. <coughs> it's kind of hard to see, hard to tell. Now, there's a reason for that. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Why he makes that statement that could be valid. But also maybe a little bit of reason now, just a little bit of doubt about it. So I'm not 100% convinced, but I think that that's the best answer I've seen so far. It may account for most of it. So he's also said that, uh, well, let's just look, let's go, ahead, go straight to it. And that's the clearest image so far. So let's go here to uh, this application. I'm going to blow it up. So what you can see right now, this is the Comet 3i Atlas, also C2025 N1. This is Earth and this is the sun. So it's just now coming around. So the sun puts out so much brightness that even when something comes around all the way, you can't see it. You know, the sun's not a point source. So it's just gotten where we can see it. Here's Earth. And we're looking this way. The sun is this way. So there actually should be a little bit of a tail going out this way away from the sun. If you draw a straight line from the sun through Comet 3i Atlas, the tail would come out this way. Now, it would be mostly behind the comet. It would seem to me that you'd be able to see just a little bit more than what we're seeing. So, I think there's still some a little bit of explanation there. It might still be missing. But uh, I think uh, Dr. Zhang is a real good uh, astronomer. And his, he's pretty close to point on that. So I'm not at all discounting what he's saying. Not at all. Pardon me, I'm hoarse. Got to have some liquid. So if we... Uh, Advance this a little bit. Let's go to 19 December. Look at where it's going to be. There's dates on there. Here we're coming in December. It should be a lot more visible. It's going away from the sun. And the tail should be a lot more obvious too by then. And it should be heading out this way. It should be in Virgo. And start, but you still have to look in the pre dawn skies to see this thing. And here we are 12th December 16th, 17th. Now that's the closest it's going to be to Earth, right there. It's pulling away from the sun, the Earth is going toward it. That's as close as it's going to be, right there. Then the tail should be over to the right. So, and that's why you're not going to sit naked eye. It's still a long way out there. So let's stop this. And Dr. Uh, Zhang, Kishin Zhang, he's got another explanation. He claims it never really changed color. He claims that instead of uh, changing color so much that he's got a couple of explanations that explains some of the anomalies around this comet. He said it never changed color. He said it just got bright, really bright. And he claims that's why it appeared to look bluish. Now, that's his claim. A lot of astronomers said it turned blue. We'll let him argue that out. So that's kind of interesting. He's also said that there were complex hydrocarbons in the coma of 3 I Atlas. He said that the ultraviolet sun from the complex hydrocarbons would break down the hydrocarbons and result in you having a carbon carbon atom, C2. The carbon carbon atoms are what fluoresce green. And right now, comet 3 I Atlas is apparently green or green again. Was it green all along? <laughs> uh, so but well, why would it have been green so early on? So there's a lot of questions about that. Why is 3i at this green? Why has it been green? Uh, well, he's got an explanation for some of these enigmas. Are they correct? You tell me uh, what you think. But I think maybe we'll let the astronomers uh, argue it out. Avi Loeb, well, he thinks it's revenant's engines, <laughs> maybe. 
he still says it's mostly most chance uh artificial uh, a natural object but he's getting one more doubt about that than one anomalies he sees so i don't know my friends uh <laughs> I think it's a natural object, but I think it's a really, really peculiar one. And it's too bad we can't study it up close to tell exactly what it is and learn more about it. <coughs> Maybe in the near future, we'll have a ability to intercept something like this. <coughs> but, however, I've also postulated that there is a big enigma, and it's an enigma any way you sh shake it. It's called the Fermi Paradox. And according to Fermi, paradox, we should be, we should have already been, the paradox is set on the the paradigms that on one side, there should be alien life here. On the other side, we don't see it. Why is that? I mean, irrefutable evidence of big megastructures and all kind of stuff. Well, there's some the various theories, great filter theory says nobody gets past where we're as a civilization. And I can see that happening to us if we're not careful. But I do think some would escape. I can go more on this in the future. There's another new theory I call mundanity, which I think is the lamest thing I've ever heard of. Oh, well, you just can't get enough technology. Well, I could have done this with the technology we had in the 60s. So I'll, I'll do a special video on that in the near future. There is the dark forest, which I like that one, but I've put a new twist on it. I got a new offshoot from that. I call it the dark fortress. The dark fortress says you wouldn't stay around your star you would actually move out to the work clouds to hide because you would be identified in short. Unless you have a very large uh, fortification forces out in your work cloud, you can protect the home planet, then okay. But you, you're definitely heading out into the work clouds and the uh, copper belts and work clouds. That's where you're going to find the bulk of your civilizations. And that if they were going to visit this, they would do it hiding as a comet. That would be exactly how they would visit so they could disguise their approach. And furthermore, that uh, I'm not saying this is the case now. I'm just saying this, if according to this paradigm, this paradox theory I've got, that this is how you could go about it. And furthermore, the most interesting time in the civilization would be right at the point before they're able to leap into space and actually start self-sustaining, you know, mining space where they could have a self-sustaining civilization in space, which is where we're on the cusp of with uh, new developments like Starship. So we may be, or, or wiping ourselves out with World War Three. Either way, we're at a cusp a crossroads where we would be, this may be the most interesting time in human history. Maybe this is when they would come check us out and see if they needed to, to eradicate us or give us a hand. Hmm. I don't know, my friends. <laughs> so there may be dark fortresses out there and maybe one's coming by. And if this isn't it, we might see one soon. I don't know. I can't say that that's the case. It's just a, it's speculative, but interesting because the paradox is existent. And I've got probably the best theory there is to explain it. So and I'm definitely convinced it is. So check out my theory on the uh, Dark Fortress. I'll post a banner up here. I'm going to say thank you all for watching. And uh, always, hey, space is interesting. I think we got a big future, so keep looking up. Subscribe, bang the bell, and click all. And again, thank you for watching. Greg out.